Becky. Well, good evening and welcome to St. Paul's. It's so good to see you. I do encourage you to grab um, your tea cups and your tea forward and come sit down. Um, my name's Cameron and I'm part of the team here. And it's wonderful to see you here. And a special welcome if you're new or joining the first church. Thank you so much for inviting us to come out afterwards. We are going to worship together now. So why don't we stand? worship let's just fill our hearts with humbly to the Lord and just pray so Lord we just thank you we thank you that we can come before you tonight we thank you for the rain that has fallen this morning we just see that it's rain has fallen Lord we just pray that your presence and your Holy Spirit would fall afresh in this place Give life 
that is when Amy came in and I said, you need to hear from her. You can share the one cup or there are individual cups. I said I'd like all of my questions to come from one person. Um, if you can come back in just a moment, I'm going to share some of mine. The Lord is here. Don't sound Turkish, is it? We'll do that again. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not forget us. You came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. And Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. Father, we do this in remembrance of him whose body we have broken. In the same way, I give thanks. And he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of you. Celebrated right in you, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine and this cup may be to you the body and the blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church, throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in the one bread. Come to this table, not because you're strong, but because you're weak. Come, not because of any goodness of your own, gives you a right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would love to love him more. Come, not because you're worthy to approach him, although you are in Christ, but because he died for sinners. Come, because he loves you and gave himself for you. And feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. Everyone's welcome to come. If you don't want to have communion or if you don't feel you're in the right place, do come forward for a blessing and keep your hands down at your side and that will be a sign to us, which I'll probably get. wave I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me 
I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name for.
Your grace is enough, more than I need. At Your word, I will believe. I wait for You. Draw near again. Let Your Spirit make me new, and I. that we can fall at your feet that we can come before you Lord I thank you that you love us for who we are no matter what mistakes we have made Lord that we can always come back to you so Lord as we go into this week 
I just pray that we'll fall at your feet afresh daily. Lord, that we'll know your presence, know your presence right now. so much Warren and Ben. It's lovely to see you here. If you have joined since the beginning, my name's Tamlin and I'm part of the team here. And this morning we played a game in our two services, okay? And I thought this was going to be a really easy game. And not one person managed to get a prize. So I said, you know what, I think the 6.30 is better and I think you guys are going to be able to do it. So... I just need to get my apparatus. Let me just give you some context. So for the dads this morning, or any guy in the church, they got a pair of socks, okay? And um, what they, we had to do was we put three buckets down here, and they had to throw the socks into a bucket, and depending on which bucket they get it into, they get a prize, as you can see, no one got a prize. So we have loads of chocolates, and I thought, I think you guys can do it. And we're not going to just leave it to the guys this time. Girls, you're welcome to come up. So I'm going to put the buckets here. And if anyone's feeling competitive tonight, I'd love for you to come and stand. We're going to try with the socks. If the socks are too hard, we do have balls. So we're going to change it up this time. So who's going to come up? Who's going to try? Who is willing? Thank you. Phil, I think you did it this morning, but I think you should have a second go. <laughs> I'll give you some context. The first service this morning, we did them all the way down the aisle. The second service, we did like this, and still no one managed. You going to try? Okay. Stand over here. So, oh, I forgot to say, if you get it into the first one, you get a celebration. If you get it into the second one, you get a chocolate bar. Well, and if you get in the last one, you get a whole slab. It's a good prize. Okay, so we're going to do this quickly. Let's see. Come on. Can you do it? It is quite hard, apparently. <laughs> so, oh, no. Okay, next, let's see. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, first one. Choose the chocolate. Amazing. Come on, Phil. I know we got the lights to deal with this time as well. Anyone? Oh, close. Phil. I think you can get a chocolate for trying. <laughs> Come on, Benji. Let's see. Whoa! Benji! Amazing. Okay, you get a slab. We've got Dame. We've got caramel, fruits and nuts, whole nuts. Oh, there we go. Well done, Benji. Okay. No, no, he gets the whole thing for himself. That was the deal this morning. So, okay, Faith, can you do it? You can just stand here. <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh, that was close. I think you can get a middle chocolate for that. Oh, you didn't get into the far one. You can get a middle one. <laughs> Got to keep some element of competition. Any bucket, small one, small chocolate, middle one, middle chocolate, far one, big chocolate. Come on, Amy. I think you can do it. Oh, nearly. Okay, okay. are you ready, Rebecca? I know, you got to deal with the lights too. Oh, nearly. Come on, Ben. Other Ben managed, I think you can get it in. Ooh, there's some tactics here. Okay. Oh. Okay, last three girls. Come on, Hannah. Oh. <laughs> oh, no, they came apart. Oh, I'll have to try the next one. There you go. Oh, that was close. That was close. No, oh. Oh, good try though. Well done, guys. A bit better than this morning. At least Benji got it in. Well done. I think we'll have to, well, maybe we'll play around afterwards and there's some more chocolate. So anyway, while um, 
Just before we do notices, I'm going to pass the small chocolates around. So please do say hi to someone around next to you. Maybe tell them what did you do in the sunshine today before it rained. And we're going to come back in a minute. Okay, we'll have to have some more chocolates afterwards if we play another round. <laughs> well, it's lovely to see you all. And I just want to um, tell you a little bit about what's happening in this coming week. And um, if you're new or here for the first time, please do come say hi afterwards. We would love to give you a welcome pack and meet you. Okay, so first thing up is tomorrow night we have healing prayer. And this is a space if... For any area of your life where you may want to put prayer in particular, we'd love for you to come um, tomorrow night and there's a team of people who are able to pray with you. And it's just a really good opportunity to bring whatever is going on before the Lord. So you can come tomorrow, you can come through that door. So if you come on Northcroft Road, enter through that way and there'll be a team of people. There's no need to book or anything like that. It's 8 p.m. tomorrow night, so please do come. And then on Thursday night, um, we have a BSIM vision meeting. Okay, so BSIM is a charity that we partner with, and the idea is that those who have loads and want to get rid of something and give it away, in a so BSIM enables them to take that. So, for example, if you have an extra bed and you're wanting to give it away, BSIM will come, collect it in the van, and then redistribute it to someone in need. But over the last little while, particularly post pandemic, Joe. Um, the, our social action coordinator has really seen a shift in what people are needing. And because of that, we want to come together and revision and pray into what BSIM looks like next and what the next um, steps are for BSIM. So if you are involved with BSIM or would like to find out more, please do come on Thursday night in the chancel room. So that room is just behind the cross. Um, if you gain, if you come in the side door, you'll be able to find out more about that. And it's a really incredible ministry. So please do come along. And then the next thing, I just want to save the date. So for all the ladies, we're going to be having another women's evening on the 13th of July. So I'm going to give you more details next week. But for now, please do just save the date. So that's a Thursday evening and we'd love for you to join us. Okay. So tonight, we're going to be starting a two-week series on Jonah. And um, Tony is going to be kicking it off for us tonight. And Tony, you'll introduce yourself to us um, in a moment, but we're incredibly grateful for you to come and speak and preside communion, so thank you. So before we do that, why don't we just pray? Lord, we just thank you that we can come and learn more about you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that something that was written so many years ago is still important and real for us today. So Lord, open our hearts and ears to what you want to say to us. And we just thank you for Tony, and we ask you to please bless him. Amen. 
Leah's going to come and do the reading, and then Tony's going to come and speak. reading is Jonah chapters 1 and 2. Jonah flees from the Lord. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord God of the heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was rougher and rougher. So they, so they asked him, What should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that, it, that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. They took, then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You held held me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swelled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountain I sank down, the earth beneath me barred me forever. But you, Lord, my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. great. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And we ask that we can get stuff from it to help us today and throughout our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd forgotten you were going to stand up and talk about other things, but I'd like you just to talk to one or two people around you. What's the benefit of living in the new covenant, i.e. since Jesus, than being an Old Testament person under the old covenant? I'm getting the whites of Tamlin's eyes, so that's okay. Uh, It's okay you don't know, but it is quite an important question actually. So what's the advantages of being in the new covenant? You've probably got, you probably only need 10 seconds, but I'll give you a minute. Excellent. 
I'll come back and ask you some questions if you want to on sharing that. But it's actually, it is really important, isn't it? We have loads of benefits. Do you know what the benefits are? It's a bit like your pension plan. Do you know what your accruing benefits are? Because um, it is quite important. So, Jonah, it's uh, an amazing story. Some feel it's a bit too hard to swallow the idea of a big fish and a person inside it, so you think it's story. Um, history, it's remarkably accurate about the world of its day. So um, there's a lot going for its historicity, actually. But um, I started off, the, oh, well, all three have come up. That's a shame. Anyway, greatest prophet. And you're a Jewish rabbi in uh, St. Albans, and he says, oh, Jonah's our best prophet. I said, why? He said, well, he's the only one who was successful. So uh, the Jewish rabbi who likes success and apparently is a big Jewish following, I think it's, he's also greatest, actually, because it's an amazing, amazing, amazing story, which I think is true because I don't think they would have made it up. It's, uh, but we'll come to that in a minute. So Nineveh was a great city. It was the largest city in the 700s. So when we're thinking 700 BC, the likelihood is that it was during the king, reign of King Jeroboam II of Israel, and that was between 785 and 750 BC. So it, David's about 1,000, Solomon about 1,000. So it's way after that, but a long way before Jesus. Okay? And the power of the day was the Assyrians. And they were nasty. So the, the largest city in the world in the 7th century, it was probably about 60 miles in circumference. So the three-day journey of 20 miles, you walked around the city, would take three days. And it's probably about 120,000 people. Uh, and it had a reputation for cruelty. Don't yet quite go on to that yet in the next slide. But um, they ruled by fear. And the British Museum says they are probably the cruelest society, which is going some, because the Romans were pretty cruel and crucifixion was cruel. But Sennacherib talks about the horses wading through blood, which was of the prisoners. I don't know if you saw in the news that some Russians have castrated some Ukrainians in prison. Well, that was easy for them to do and did a lot they would cut off different bits of you. So you'd I'd say there's a steel in the British Museum where there are bits of bodies around because they would take off your ears and blind you. If you know the story of um, Manasseh, the last king, he was taken in hooks to, uh, to um, the Assyrians. Well, it says in hooks, and Amos talks about hooks. So they put a hook in your nose or in your mouth and led you into captivity. So gratuitous cruelty, and what they did with Manasseh was they took him by a hook, and the next picture shows a steel which is in the Pergamon Museum in Brazil, uh, in, um, in Berlin, in Germany, and you may not be able to see it actually, but there's a big chief, and that's the Assyrian king, and there are two little people, and one of them's probably Manasseh, and if you notice in the detail, they have a hook in their mouth, and he was made to see his family, and then they thought his last sight would be killing them, and then they blinded him. So, gratuitously violent, and they meant that they were the largest city, they were the dominant power, and you imagine coming to you and saying, will you go? and say to them, repent. Now you might want to say repent, but behind repentance was what Jonah thought would happen, which is God wanted to forgive them. And he was offended. He did not think that it was right that such people should be forgiven. And that's why he set off when God told him to go east. Nineveh's now where Mosul is in Iraq. He went west to Spain. Now, um, on the... Uh, the, the amazing thing then about this story is the, the intentionality to forgive 
other people. Now, in your discussions of the New Covenant and the Old Covenant, what were things going for the New Covenant? What do you get in the New Covenant you didn't get in the Old Covenant? Forgiveness? For what? Grace? Well, you had grace in the Old Testament. You're right about forgiveness. Do you know the Old Testament had a big sacrificial system which was how the Israelites could keep right with God. But it didn't cover deliberate sin. So there was no sacrifice you could do if you had deliberately done wrong. So when David sinned with Bathsheba, actually there was no sacrifice he could present. And so he's very grateful for God's mercy because it goes beyond what that law allowed. So we now, if you had a confession, you might say, forgive us our sin and our, uh, about what we've done inadvertently and our deliberate sin. That would not have been a line available for them. So you couldn't get forgiveness for when you deliberately sin. That's why Jesus on the cross is so amazing when he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing when they were hammering in nails and thought they knew what they were doing. So that's one benefit. What's the second benefit about the new covenant? Yes, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us, whereas before God was scary because of our sinfulness. So the sacrifice being accepted. Now linked to that is we were outsiders, so we were all Gentiles. We weren't included at all. Okay, so the old covenant was for the Jews. And if you wanted to come in, you had to leave your God outside and you came in and you became a Jew. That was the idea of the evangelism. So it was for Gentiles, it was for deliberate sin, um, and uh, there was a whole system they had. If you look at the foundation of Israel, what sacrifices they had to do. I'm just going to focus on one of them briefly, which was the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement for Jews is the holiest day and the riskiest day, the scariest day in the year, because what happens in the whole year is the community, all of us, sin. And when you sin, you trot off and you give a sacrifice. One of the differences for the priest would have been I'd have been doing sacrifices all the time, which wouldn't have suited me really. But um, you, you'd have received all these sacrifices. And the high priest, in some of the sacrifices, he had to eat the meat, or the priest had to eat the meat, because they carried the sin of the people. And the idea was once a year, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, and if he was received, then it meant the sins of the year were covered. Now, in that sacrifice, one, they had a, two goats as part of it. One goat was sacrificed on the altar, and the other goat was sent off into the desert. And when it was done in Leviticus, you can see it in 16th Day of Atonement, that one was sent off. But if you look at how the Jews did it, that one had to suffer. It had to be... Um, the one was killed humanely and offered on a sacrifice on the temple. This one was sent off in the desert. It was, it was knocked down a, a slope, a hill, such that it broke all its body, so it suffered. Now, Jesus fulfilled both those. So he was the lamb, the perfect lamb on the altar, and he was the scapegoat in the desert. Now, the scapegoat was to, when we sin, we both offend God, because God's holy, and he can't have our sin near him it's a bit like cancer cells you've got to obliterate all of them you can't leave some nice ones because they're not so Jesus covered our sin when he died on the cross because he was the lamb on the altar he was the atonement lamb but he was also the scapegoat called the Asahel for the Jews who suffered by falling down the manuscript. Now, that one was offered to the devil. Because the devil's got rights, and the devil is a legalist. And when the, he fell, I think he was in charge of the earth, and when we join the rebellion, he has rights on us. And so the scapegoat was a, a given to him, and he had rights, and he chose to make it suffer because he's the same sort of ilk as the people of Nineveh had got sort of allied with him. So Jesus becomes our scapegoat, but Jonah is the scapegoat.
picture. And the scapegoat was the devil's possession, and he killed him brutally. And Jonah went into the pit for three days. And that's the same as Jesus going into the grave for three days. And he says, I'm in Sheol, which was sort of Hades, hell. And then he's released. And that's why Jesus quotes Jonah, because Jonah is the sign to them that Jesus will fulfill, that three days in the grave and he will rise. He will be fulfilling the sign of Jonah. So it's part of an amazing gospel story. So the list has come up, and it's come up as one. I was trying to do it in bits. But God's forgiveness goes way beyond what's reasonable. So God's forgiveness is offensive. If you said to those Ukrainians who've had their, friend, their husbands or sons back mutilated, what about forgiving the Russians? It's a hard ask. It's a hard ask. Or, you know, in the war, the Japanese prisoners of war, when they were maltreated, you know, I knew lots of people who didn't buy Japanese for generations, for years, because it had been so hard. The Ninevites were that. It was much, much harder to think of them forgiving. Now, that is really, in a way, amazing news, because no matter how sinful you are, if God cared for the Ninevites at the height of their power, he's actually quite a forgiving God. Okay, so never think God won't forgive you, because this was the gospel sign that Jonah is in the Old Testament as the sign that God, the system covered Jews and non-deliberate sin, but God's heart went out to the whole world, including the wicked bosses. Okay? So forgiveness is amazing, and you think, oh, that's wonderful, isn't it? Because it's pretty difficult if I've got to go and talk to someone who's done me harm, um, but actually for me, that's really good news. Now, the flip side of the point is you get the next slide all up in a go, probably. Next slide. Sin is much more damaging than we think. We live in a world where you think, oh, my individual sin, you know, it's fine, it's legal if it doesn't damage anyone else. Well, I tell you, it does damage other people. It pollutes a place. So if you think of Cain and Abel, when... Cain killed Abel, Abel's blood cried out from the land. Well, you know the time when Sarah, Abraham, Sarah must have been an amazing woman, wasn't she? Because she was in her 90s, and he went down to Egypt, and he was afraid the king Ahimelech would take a fancy to Sarah. So he passed off as his cousin, which she was. And Abimelech did fancy her at 99, and he, he took her into his household and married her. So she was some amazing woman. Now, what happened to him was because of that, God saw it and was displeased, and, and all the women in that country didn't produce children. And he repented and paid it off because that was the consequence of his sin. When it was unintentional, Abraham had sort of let it happen because he was afraid, otherwise Abimelech would kill him and take his wife. So sin really does matter. And it affects generations. So also, the other benefit of the new covenant. In the old covenant, your sin affected the next four generations, but you had mercy for thousands of generations. And those you love you, that's in the Ten Commandments. So, and I use funny ministry sometimes, that when someone's got a problem that you think, where's the root of this? And it may not be in them at all. It may be in their parents or their grandparents or their great-grandparents or their great-great-grandparents. And that was the situation in the Old Testament. So David's sin affected the whole of his line. Then it said, the sword will not depart from your family because his sin affected his kids. Now, in the New Testament, New Covenant, Ezekiel says, no longer will the parents eat sour grapes and the children's teeth be set on edge. So our privilege in the New Covenant is that we can break those rights and we can get freedom. And you pray. You pray for forgiveness for the people in your forebears who've, who've uh, sinned. 
And you pray, you say, God, bless, I confess on their behalf what they have done. And I ask now that you cover with your blood their sin, that you release them from it. Because what you loose in heaven, and what you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. I pray blessing on them. And I ask that you cut off from the family line all the rights that the evil one has through their sin on me and my children. And I do that in the mighty name of Jesus. And that's an effective prayer to change the legacy, get rid of the bad stuff in the legacy. That's the new covenant. That's why we're in a better place than the Old Testament. So this sin is much more damaging, but we can deal with it. But don't think that sin doesn't matter. And so in the story of Jonah, his sin, they said, what's going on? Why is this storm? And then they start casting lots. And it comes to Jonah. So they go up to him and say, what have you done? What's, what, tell me about what your life's like as to why this lot has fallen on you. And they obviously are really nice people because when he tells them, he says, actually, it's a done deal. You know, I'm in trouble. I've been told to go east and I've gone west and it's God. And actually, he is an amazing God and he does a, a good gospel talk while saying, I'm the guy. And then they try and not push him overboard. They try and, but the storm gets worse. So in the end, reluctantly, with his permission, they push him overboard and God gets this fish to swallow him. And you may, as I say, find that a bit difficult to swallow. I don't know, but I do think God's got means at his control, which we don't understand. And you do wonder why the Ninevites repented, because I discovered a fascinating history, which in my notes somewhere I wrote down, but I may not have been able to find it now. But in 769 BC, the king in these, they found the record of what he did in the year. And it was basically each year for 49 years, it went to a certain place and beat them up. He did a military campaign. And you have echoes of that in Israel. It was the time of year when kings go out to war. And in 769, he didn't. He stopped. So it could have been Jonah who'd gone to them. And he changed. Um, so, and it may have been that if Jonah had come out wrinkly from being vomited out by a fish and been in, in acid for three days that actually he was a sign to make them wonder. And perhaps that was part of his effect as he was the only prophet who was successful. Okay? So, for us, what's about us? And there are, there are five or six things which I was going to go through one by one, but I think they'll probably all come up together. Will you obey God when it's hard? If God says, go to so-and-so, and you think, <clears throat> no. Think Ananias going to the persecutor, Saul. Would you, Ananias, you can imagine trembling. But he goes in, and he has believed God, because he says, brother Saul. So he's done his machinery. Or you think of Abraham when he went up the hill to sacrifice to God his son and said God will provide the sacrifice and he'd reasoned it says in Hebrews that if he killed his only son who God had promised so much through God would raise him from the dead will you obey God when it's tough will you trust him and the second one is is your grid big enough to understand God's ways I do you just dismiss it oh that's not that's not godly. <laughs> oh, it is, actually. So I think there's something about your mental grid. I, I think of the prodigal son story. I come back to it, and you may have heard me say it. But would you give your son a lot of money to go wrong with? Mm, I'm not sure I would have done. I'd have thought that wasn't good parenting. Just Jesus did, or he talked about it in the story, as the way to help the son in the long term, that he wastes his money on wine, women, and song, getting people into trouble, and then came home. God's ways are bigger than our ways. Will you expand your mind? John, when he talks in John about the children, he says, are just hungry. They are, aren't they? They don't think, Tamlin knows, your child doesn't say to you, are you tired, mummy? 
No, they just think of their needs. Entirely appropriate. As young people, John says, you're the ones who do battle with the evil one. You overcome the devil. And as Christians, we should be in that mode when we're not children. Old people, it says, understand God's ways. If you've been around a bit, you understand, oh, this could be God. God funding bad behavior, well, that could be God. Is your grid big enough to understand God's way? Is your heart warm enough to embrace what God's doing? Will you cross the social boundaries? One of the wonderful churches in the New Testament, the Philippians, started with a jailer, a top businesswoman, and a slave girl. That pretty well smashed all the social norms of the day. That was the church. Then, will you see yourself as God does and accept your sin? Jonah is honest, I, yeah, I've sinned. We spend most of our time not owning that. I don't know if you know, but in the Anglican system, there are two seasons, Lent and Advent, for self-reflection. When you look inside. And one of the prayers of those is, grant me true repentance, which is to see things as you see them. God. Because we often spend our time justifying ourselves, and so we're not really available for God to say, actually, you did that wrong. Or, if you're shame-based, you're thinking everything's rubbish. And the answer is, with God, that some things may be wrong and some things may be false guilt. And you see things as God sees them. If you come to the depths and say, I have sinned like David with Bathsheba, do you have hope when recognizing your sin? Because one of the reasons you won't go there is you think that you'll be condemned. And if you're a good person, actually you generally condemn yourself. So forgiving yourself is often the bigger issue. So Jonah said, I'm the man, I've done wrong, but he had hope. And will you pray when you're in the sh a hole or the fish's stomach? The hole you dug. Because that's what Jonah did. And in his prayer, he recognizes he's gone down into death. So there's quite a lot in Jonah 1 and 2. And it is the gospel in the Old Testament. And it's quite a tale. So I think just select one of those perhaps when you read it. If you, you may just as you look at them, you know, just uh, possibly pray in tongues and ask God in your heart, what's the one for me tonight? Of knowing the grace of God is wider than you think. Knowing that sin matters more than you think it does. Because we stand before God, worthy to come to communion, not out of ourselves, but because we've been given it. Why don't we just stand? Like there's a lot to, to reflect on there. So why don't we just, sometimes when we take a moment to reflect and it's just really helpful to open ourselves up, to offer our, in our body language to just opening ourselves to the Lord. say, come Holy Spirit, just stir inside us what you want to say to us now. Out of those things, what are you putting on my heart?
I love that verse in Jonah chapter 2, the last verse. It says, salvation comes from the Lord. And he's the only one who can save us. And I think all these things are things that we can't do on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. We need others to stand around us. So if there's something that's really on your heart, why don't you come forward? We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you feel like you're in that dig, deep, dark hole or that pits of the stomach. Jesus is calling you. So we're going to worship now. And I think as we do that, if there's something you would like to pray for, why don't you come? We'd love to invite you to come forward. Because salvation comes from the Lord. He is the one who gives us what we need. And particularly if there's something where you feel you can't be forgiven. Come forward, we'd love to pray for you. We're going to worship now. Oh God, my Father. God, my home, this house of healing, this place of hope, where I forsaken, I'm now returning. Simple devotion is your desire.
Holy Spirit, just come full afresh on us now. Fill us afresh. And as we go into this week, Lord, I just pray that you just will keep filling us up, that you keep filling us up as we do and go into the world, Lord, as we do different things. Lord, I just pray that we know your presence with us. We'll know your peace. We'll know your love, your grace that you so freely give to us. So bless us. Now we pray in your name. Amen. It's been lovely to be with you this evening. Please do stay around. We're going to have some snacks and refreshments at the back. If you're new or here for the first time, please do come say hi. We'd love to give you a welcome back. And otherwise, we hope to see you next week.